welcome to Texas Motor Speedway just north of Fort Worth in Denton County, Texas, where when we last left you, there was a lot of question about what would happen with today's running of the Firestone Firehawk 600. That's the way it looked a little bit earlier as they all waited for their uh, teams to go out and begin their morning warm-up and practice. The drivers went into pretty serious conferences, so did the team owners, the managers. There was a lot of concern about the high speeds here. And then finally a decision was made and the decision unfortunately is to go pack up and go home. The 2001 Firestone Firehawks 600 at Texas Motor Speedway was supposed to be the first time that the kart series would hit the high banks of still the fairly new Texas Motor Speedway. Kart's rival series, the IRL, was already racing at the track since its opening in 1997 and even added a second race in the 1998 season. The IRL, however, ran lower power naturally aspirated engines as well as a chassis that had much higher downforce, which made it more feasible for the series to run the track. But even the IRL made rule changes to slow their cars down as they were initially around the 225 mile an hour mark and they wanted to slow them down to about the 200 and 15 mile an hour mark. The success of these IRL events was definitely on the radar of the kart series, and in the year 2000 they began negotiations to race at the track, and was ultimately added as the fourth race on the calendar in the 2001 season. There was obviously initial concerns right away, as with the turbocharged kart engines along with less downforce and drag, everyone knew the speeds were going to be extremely high and g-forces were going to be extreme, as the kart series hasn't raced on a track with banking like this since 1983 in Atlanta. Rumors even started circulating that CART may use the infield road course that the American Le Mans series was using in the 2001 season. Both Texas Motor Speedway President Eddie Gossage as well as driver Mauricio Guzelman suggested that suspension parts would need to be upgraded to withstand the lateral g-force in the turns. With these concerns being legitimate, CART would conduct several private tests before the event to try to nail down a safe and proper package for the drivers. The first one took place in December 2000 with Kenny Brack who previously raced at the track in the IRL. Kart's target speed was set at 225 miles an hour. Kenny Brack completed over 100 laps and had a top speed of 221 miles an hour which was below the target that Kart was aiming for. So Kart, track officials, Brack, and Team Rahal were satisfied with the test and data collected. Kart set the rules package based on this and dropped the manifold pressure down from 40 to 37 and installed the Hanford device on the rear wing. However, it later came out by Eddie Gossage in 2016 that Kenny Brack was not going full throttle during this test. Several other tests took place by a variety of different teams and drivers in February, but temperatures were low and most of the testing was plagued by rain. Some drivers' top speeds were significantly under that 225 mile an hour mark until Dario Franchitti, who completed 190 laps, turned in a speed of 225.7 miles an hour. Scott Dixon also turned a lap of 200 225 miles an hour and Penske Racing's Elio Castroneves turned in a lap of 226 miles an hour. No incidents were reported during testing and carts seemed to be within the window that they were aiming for around the 225 mile an hour mark. The only concerns that some drivers did have was that the track surface was kind of rough but was still relatively easy to hold wide open around the track. However, once again Mauricio Guzman expressed concerns that cart had the wrong wing configuration to race at Texas Motor Speedway, and the cars were too fast for this track. Following testing, very few changes were made to the cars themselves, as the main concern among drivers seemed to be the roughness of the track. However, before the race weekend, Texas Motor Speedway did smooth out some of the bumps that were a concern. Coming into this race weekend, the kart series had some extra eyes on it, as this was the same weekend that the movie Driven was released in theaters. Now, you could say what you want about the movie, but it did have a pretty good cast. Some such as Sylvester Stallone and Burt Reynolds. So one would think with that extra publicity that more eyes would be on this kart race 
Austin, Texas. On Friday morning, the cars would hit the track for the first time and Tony Kanon would top the session with an average speed of 233.539 miles an hour, which ended up being a full second faster than the fastest time that was done in testing. Also randomly before this session, Kart decided to re-measure the racetrack for scoring purposes and ended up utilizing a length of 1.482 miles instead of the standard 1.5 miles that NASCAR and the IRL use. The session went incident free. Friday afternoon, second practice saw Mauricio Guzman, who is the most outspoken driver about concerns regarding this event, would be the first one to crash. His car got loose exiting turn number two and he hit the inside wall at 66 G's. His foot got stuck between the pedals which made the car go wide open as he slid into the outside wall hitting it at 113.1 G's. Guzman claimed to have blacked out during this accident. Thankfully he was not seriously injured but he did have some bruising on his shoulders and ribs which led him to sit out for the rest of the weekend. After the Friday session, some drivers did compliment Texas Motor Speedway on the improvements of smoothing out some of the bumps. But this was also when safety concerns were brought to the spotlight once again, as it was reported that two drivers experienced dizziness and felt disoriented after running in their cars at over 230 miles an hour. At the time, the identities of these drivers was not disclosed, but it was later revealed that Tony Kanon and Alex Zanardi experienced those symptoms, so many believe that it may have been these two drivers. It was also reported that Max Pepys was unable to tell the front stretch from the back stretch when his crew told him to pit. Adrian Fernandez also reported to the media that he was experiencing dizziness. And CARP Medical Affairs Director Steve Alvey said that he's never experienced anything like this in his 25 years of working in motorsports. And there is also other reports of drivers feeling dizzy and losing their balance after getting out of the car. Saturday morning's practice session would see Cristiano D'Amata have this accident, but thankfully he was uninjured. We would also see a drastic increase in speeds as Paul Tracy topped the charts at over 236.6 miles an hour. Qualifying would take place later that day, with Kenny Brack taking the pole on the official track record at the Speedway, with a time of 22.854 and an average speed of 233 point four four seven miles an hour later that saturday afternoon patrick carpentier visited the infield care center to have his wrist checked out which was previously injured at long beach and while he was getting it checked he did mention to the medical staff there that he could not walk straight for four minutes after exiting the car this led to a driver survey that was taken at a private driver's meeting and 21 of the 25 drivers in the starting field said that they were suffering from some type of disorientation and vertigo like symptoms. Some drivers also claimed that they had no peripheral vision and limited reaction time. This was because of the super high G loads of 5.5 which is almost double of what a fighter pilot endures at one time and drivers were experiencing this for 14 to 18 seconds of the 23 second lap which is absolutely insane. Dr. Olvi contacted Dr. Richard Jennings a former flight director at NASA and professor of aviation medicine at the University of Texas. They discussed the tolerance of the human body and vertical G loads. Jennings said that the human body could not tolerate sustained loads of more than 4 to 4.5 Gs. This is when CART officials determined that the race could not be run at more than 225 miles an hour without raising safety concerns of G-force induced loss of consciousness which would be absolutely horrendous. IndyCar officials were doing their best to make a last ditch effort to try to slow down the cars, but everything that they can do was only worth about 3-4 to four miles per hour which wasn't really going to change much, and they couldn't detune the engines anymore without the risk of catastrophic engine failure which is kind of funny because reliability back then was already pretty brutal, so I could only imagine if it was going to get worse by making a change like this. They even could considered putting a makeshift chicane on the back straightaway, I'm guessing something like here what they did in Baltimore, which obviously was not gonna work. 
Time was quickly running out and race day came and the morning warm up was cancelled. And then finally only 2 hours before the race is scheduled to start, they made the official call to postpone the race and sent 60,000 fans home. The decision was made after CART President Joe Heitzler had a series of meetings with drivers, owners and sponsors and all parties agreed that it didn't make sense to hold the race under these circumstances. It's disappointing but yet necessary for me to announce that CART, along with its teams, its drivers, its manufacturers and sponsors, have determined that we must postpone today's race. We have examined every conceivable alternative and have come to the conclusion that the situation we are faced with leads to this decision, that we cannot comfortably race today. Therefore, we are postponing the Firestone 500, due to concerns over the physical demands placed on our drivers while traveling at speeds of more than 235 miles per hour in this 1.5 mile oval. Texas Motor Speedway President Eddie Gossage heavy criticized CART on this decision as they assured him that the race would be run, especially after all the tests at the track that were completed. The late Robin Miller also said that CART should have known that there was a problem the minute the first driver clocked over 230 miles an hour on Friday. Cart officials held out on the possibility of the race being rescheduled, but there was simply no room on the calendar and it was ultimately cancelled. This making the second race in the 2001 season to be cancelled after the Rio 200 in Brazil was also cancelled when the Rio municipal government missed a deadline for guaranteeing payment and sanctioning fees and failed to grant access to the facility to the promoters to begin preparing for the race. As CART's rival series the IRL continued to race at Texas Motor Speedway, what would happen next due to the result of the cancellation of this race is definitely one of the final nails in the coffin for the CART series. As Speedway Motorsports, the owner of Texas Motor Speedway, sued CART on May 8th for breach of contract. Damages include issuing refunds for over 60,000 tickets, the purse of the race, the $2.1 million sanctioning fee, and additional compensation for promotional expenses, lost profits, and other damages. During this lawsuit, it kept emerging that CART had ignored repeated requests to conduct extensive testing at the track before aborting the race. On October 16th, the two parties ended up settling for an undisclosed amount amount. Those exact terms were not disclosed, but estimates were between 5 and $7 million paid out by CART in exiting the contract for the 2002 and 2003 race. The aftermath of this whole ordeal was heavily criticized by the fans and media, but the sanctioning body was commended by many for not putting the drivers in danger, because who knows what could have happened if that race actually took place. This race is largely viewed as as the lowest point in the CART series and the first sign of its demise and it would damage the organization for years to come. CART reported that it spent 3.5 million dollars for the settlement in legal costs resulting in a 1.7 million dollar loss for the third quarter of 2001 and not long after in 2003 CART officially declared bankruptcy and was sold and became known as Champ Car. Champ Car never tried to return to the Texas Motor Speedway, but the IRL race there and Texas Motor Speedway is still part of the IndyCar series to this day. Let me know in the comments what you thought about this whole Texas CART debacle of 2001. Do you think this was the final nail in the coffin for the CART series? That's going to wrap it up for today's video. Thank you guys so much for tuning in as always. If you like what you've seen here today, Today, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you can get all my content in your feed. I upload every Tuesday on a variety of topics in motorsports history, mainly regarding IndyCar and NASCAR. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the thumbs up. It helps me out. We're continuing to build this great channel and community here, and I really appreciate every single one of you tuning in. Until next time, take care, everyone.